Hello, listeners. This is Kat, and welcome back to Put Your Hands Up Podfix. This is the continuation of Small of the Stars. This will be Part 34, Chapter 34, entitled Demonstrations of Ability. Izuka stands at the edge of the waiting room with the rest of Class 1A. Most of them are perched on the three long sofas in a set U-shape in the center of the room. But some of them are standing and talking to each other. There's a large flat-screen television on one of the walls that's running through, essentially, B-roll of the sports festival stadium grounds, the arena in the center, and onlookers filling into their seats. In the corner of the screen, several digital numbers count down to when the festival will actually begin, to when Hizashi as present Mike will announce all the first-year classes competing. You okay? Hitoshi asks beside him. Their shoulders are pressed together. Well, Izuka's shoulders pressed into Hitoshi's upper arm, but it's the contact that matters and not the technicalities. And Hitoshi is leaning just a little bit into Izuka's face. Izuka hums softly. Is he? He is nervous as all hell, and has been since he woke up early this morning, earlier than Aizawa. He'd barely been able to force down a light breakfast, and only under an unimpressed and yet still worried glare from his dad. He knows that this isn't a defining moment for him like it is for a lot of the other students. They're hoping to make a name for themselves, to push their way onto the podium and loudly declare their strength before tens of millions of people, to put their names out there as upcoming daylight heroes ready to take on the world. For Zuku, that's not the case. He's not going to be a daylight hero, and he knows that even if he doesn't place at all, his dad's or auntie Kayama will offer him an internship. There's significantly less pressure to do well riding on Izuku's shoulders, he knows he's powerful. His dads and his auntie know it too. Hell, as a future underground hero, there is actually merit to not doing well, to keeping Amahagi a secret, to placing poorly on purpose and just sitting in the stands to watch the festival play out. But Izuku wants. Without Amahagi, he's quirkless, and that mentality, that feeling of needing to prove his place in a world that isn't made for people like him, has not gone away just because he has a powerful quirk under his control. There is a part of Izuku, small though it is, that still feels like he doesn't belong at UA. That enrolling was a mistake, and that part of him is eager to prove his worth. Yeah, he finally says, turning to smile at Hitoshi. Yeah, I'm okay. Are you still going to throw your results? Slowly, Hitoshi shakes his head. No, Aizawa-san and I talked about it more last night, actually. Izuku remembers his dad slipping out onto the balcony after dinner to talk on the phone. It must have been Hitoshi. I was just worried about my quirk activation requirements being known, you know? He said that I should try my hardest this year, since whichever agency I intern under would be highly likely to take me back in subsequent years, and that I can basically willingly sit out for the next two years. It's not like this is graded. Hitoshi tips his head back and scans his eyes around their classmates. Actually, what convinced me was him saying that he won his first year of sports festival, and I know how little is known about him and his quirk in public circles, so... He shrugs. It makes me feel better. Izuka grins, and some of his nerves slip away. Good. You've worked really hard to be here. It would be a shame if you didn't shove all your training in everyone's faces at least once. He laughs, then light and breathy. You and me have to show the world what villainous quirks can do, right? Well, Izuka less so. He's already killed people with his quirk. He's not sure he's ready to be scrutinized by the public for it. But Adoshi doesn't need to be privy to those thoughts. He just needs to know that Izuka's in his corner. Oh, hell yeah. Hitoshi reaches across him to ruffle Izuka's hair. And Todoroki's got a new trick up his sleeve, too. The boy in question is across the room, pouring himself a cup of water, but he turns at his name, flicking his gaze over them both briefly. When he has his water, Todoroki approaches them again. Izuku, he says, friendly and honest, as he has been since school started. I hope you know I'm going to give it my all to beat you. For the last week and a half, Izuku had been dedicating all of his after-school hours to helping Todoroki get comfortable with his fire. They've become running buddies in the mornings, too, which was nice, but that's not the point. The point is that Izuka knows full well that Todoroki is far more formidable of an opponent now than he was just two weeks ago, and that's saying something because his eyes was no joke either. But Izuka wasn't concerned, or scared, or anything other than excited to see his new brother do his best. He grins. Likewise. Oh, shit, Kaminari says with a smile on his face. Are we doing declarations of war? I want in. Shut it, Dunn's face. Bakugo says as he stalks up to Izuku, Todoroki, and Atoshi, I'm going to beat all you fuckers. Get ready to eat dirt. Izuku's trying to think of a good retort when Todoroki calmly and utterly, confusedly, says, But you don't have an earth-based quirk. And then Izuku's laughing, and Hitoshi's coughing to hide his laughter, and Bakugo is staring at Todoroki like he can't figure out if he's being serious or not. What? Todoroki asks, blinking around at them. 
There's no time to answer, though, because the countdown on the television suddenly takes up the whole screen and Hisashi's voice floats through the speakers. Hey, first years, we're getting ready to start here in a few seconds. Go ahead and line up in orderly rows, in whichever order you like, with the class reps up front. As soon as the doors open, start your walk out into the stadium proper. The words cut off, and Izuku catches Momo's eyes across the room. Right. Showtime. All right, you heard Yamada-sensei, Izuku says, holding his hand in the air to get everyone's attention. Let's do three rows of six. If you can't figure it out on your own, I'll start placing you by your student numbers, so keep your heads out of your asses and get in line. Hitoshi snickers beside him. You sound so much like Aizawa-san, it's not even funny. He murmurs before hooking his hand in Todoroki's elbow and dragging him into place. No one in the class says anything as they figure out where they want to stand. Momo finds her place beside Izuku, and she looks over at him with an approving nod. When he'd earned the title of class president, Izuku thought he would be embarrassed every time he was expected to lead his classmates, but after taking charge during the break-in, he finds that it's easy and almost second nature to channel his dad and direct his fellow students. The fact that they all trust and listen to him is helpful as well. Great. Thank you, Izuku says, facing down the rows of his peers. I don't care how you act out there. I'm not here to be your parent or say that we need to uphold some lofty image of the UA hero course when we're just a bunch of 15-year-olds. But I do expect you to stay in your rows until it seems like a good time to move. Use your heads. All clear? Hitoshi's right. He does sound like Aizawa. It's even funnier when some of the classmates say, Understood, Aizawa-san. And they're literally not wrong in any way. Izuku is never going to become a teacher. Not ever. He has no idea how his dads manage it, and that's on top of them being pro heroes as well. As promised, the doors open a short while later, sound floods into the room, Hisashi's voice over the speaker system in the stadium, the crowd cheering, the wind whistling as it slips down and through the tunnel. With Momo at his side, Izuku leads Class 1A out into the lights and the roar of the crowd. The opening ceremony is loud. Bakugo gives just about the shortest speech in history. From the booing that Izuku can hear, it's not received well by most people, but all the members of Class 1A shift on their feet and they grin. This is a declaration of war to everyone, and a challenge for them all to rise up and meet him. It's not eloquent, but it's effective as hell. And if the other classes and the spectators don't see that, then, well, that's their own fault. Izuku has watched the sports festival exactly twice. Two years ago, he got to sit in the announcer's box with Izashi and Aizawa for the third year's festival, watching through the windows as students competed. Last year, Izuku had spent the day at Itoshi's house, where they had watched the first year's gauntlet run with dreams in their eyes and all on their tongues. But more than just watching for cool quirks, which of course he had been doing, and he had kept a notebook full of his favorites, Izuku noticed something last year while he and Itoshi ate cups of instant ramen and drank too much soda on their cheat day. The sports festival has a pattern. Every year, for each of the three grades, there are three events, a large mass elimination event, a team event, and a solo event. Most people only care about the solo event because it's the best way to showcase flashy quirks, but Izuku isn't most people. The mass elimination event is just as much about luck as it is about skill. You have to be lucky to not get caught in a death match with another student or in the crossfire of students who are. You have to get lucky to place within a certain percentage of all competitors. You have to be lucky that your quirk or your skills are enough to see you through every obstacle. Additionally, the first place winner from the mass elimination event always has a handicap going into the team event. Sometimes it's a literal handicap, like being forced to wear weights, and sometimes it's a target on their back. Either way, Izuka doesn't want that. He wants to place high, but not first. The team event is less about luck and more about either having a solid plan or being able to improvise on the spot. It's also about knowing your classmates and sometimes being willing to take risks with them. This is also where you can make or break everything with your own personal choices. Teams are not randomly assigned. They're purposeful and driven by the competitors. It's as much a test of dedication and skill as it is a test of trust. And the solo event is kind of boring, in Izuku's opinion. It's not crafty, it doesn't require layers of thinking, it's one quirk against another, one physical body against another. It is, quite literally, just no-holds-barred sparring, and Izuku does that in class now, so it's not something he's really looking forward to. Yes, he wants to prove himself, but in his opinion, it's significantly more impressive to be able to place well in the first two events than the third. But no one wants his opinion right now, and Itoshi has already heard him complain about it more than once. Regardless, when Auntie Kayama spins the wheel, Izuku isn't surprised that it lands on an obstacle course. He would bet his next meal that the whole thing was rigged for that specifically. They're given a small set of rules and an even smaller set of instructions, and then they're directed toward the starting line, a tunnel in the side of the stadium. Izuku understands immediately, and he grabs Satoshi's wrist and drags him forward. Izuku, what? This is the first obstacle. 
He says quietly following a path being cut by Todoroki and Bakugo to the front of the horde of more than 200 students. It's a bottleneck, and it's so stupidly similar to the exit of the cafeteria in the hallway beyond the damn break-in that it makes his skin crawl. He wants to find Nezu through the cameras and ask if he did this on purpose, or if he just has no idea what happened to all the kids eating lunch that day. But it doesn't really matter, because an air horn sounds, and the race starts. With the majority of the student body held in place by Todoroki's blast device, including Bakugo, who'd gotten shoved backward both by Todoroki and Totoshi, the initial pathway is free and clear for the three of them to sprint ahead. And for a while, that's all they do. They just run in loose triangle formations, and seemingly enjoying each other's company for as long as it's just the three of them. Then there's a series of popping explosions sounding off behind them, and Todoroki looks over his shoulder at Izuku and Itoshi. That's my cue. See you in the next event. He takes off using his ice as a propulsion method, and Izuku's not even mad that he hasn't used his fire yet. They've all got aces up their sleeves, and no one else in the class knows how much practice Todoroki's been putting in lately. Izuku laughs as Bakuga passes them with a string of curses and shouted threats aimed at Todoroki, and then he digs his feet in and charges ahead. Hitoshi keeps pace with him easily, well practiced at running beside Izuku over long distances and suicide sprints. They get past the robots easily. Todoroki attempts a blockade with his ice, but one black hole from Izuku blasts a section of ice apart and gets himself and Hitoshi through. They split up at the chasm, each taking their own path across the ropes. Hitoshi's faster on that part, his agility and speed trumping Izuku's density and need to be careful about his foot placement. But Izuku catches up in the minefield, laughing as he bounces between mines and uses a few well-placed black holes to slow down opponents and ensure that he doesn't fall too far behind the leaders. Izuku's more than happy with eighth place, and he stops just over the finish line to cheer Itoji into tenth. Slinging his arm around Itoji's neck, Izuku walks into the center of the arena and slides up right to where Todoroki and Bakugo are glaring at each other. Well, Bakugo is glaring. Todoroki is just kind of standing there. So, Izuku says, leaning forward to half-insert himself between the two of them. Who won? Todoroki blinks and looks at Izuku. I did. Fucking barely, Bakugo snarls, explosions popping off in his palms. And only because you got a head start, you fucking icy hot. Hitoshi snorts out a laugh, drawing Bakugo's ire right to him, and Izuku spends the next ten minutes mediating between the three of them while the rest of the participants finish the obstacle course. As soon as the second round is announced, Izuku swivels his head between Todoroki and Bakugo. So, teammates? Love that you didn't ask me, Hitoshi says, to which Izuku elbows him in the ribs. Hey, rude, Izuku-kun. But he doesn't move away. In fact, he tightens his arm around Izuku's shoulders as if to cement himself to his side. Todoroki appraises them both. Sure, he shrugs. I don't have anything to prove. If you're ready to play keep away, I'd be glad to have you. Bakugo, on the other hand, just snarls. Fuck that. I'm not teaming up with you assholes. Watch your back, Icy Hot. I'm coming for those points. And with that, he stalks away quickly, grabbing Kirishima by the front of his shirt before disappearing to find two more teammates. Who do we want as our fourth? Hitoshi asks, eyes boring into the side of Izuku's head instead of looking around to appraise the students around them. Izuku hums, taking a moment to think. With Todoroki and himself, they have plenty of power and a good amount of range. They can gain height for a quick advantage and use Black Hole to plummet just as quickly. Hitoshi provides agility and surprise attacks with his quirk. Plus, he has melee opportunities with his quarterstaff. He had not been allowed the capture weapon, for whatever reason. Izuku can actually think of a few reasons, like the obvious similarity to Aizawa's own capture weapon, and then there's the fact that the sports festival is a good opportunity for the support course to show off and advertise, which means that any flashy support items should really only be coming from them. And then there's also the fact that this is an event that's kind of stupidly meant to showcase quirks, and if Hitoshi spends the whole time whipping around his capture weapon and not using his quirk, there are going to be a lot of upset sponsors and viewers, but... All of those are stupid reasons, because they still let him bring his quarterstaff, so they should have let him bring his capture weapon. Christ, Izuku shakes himself out of that derailment and sweeps his eyes through the mass of students. We have crowd control, range, power, melee, and surprise attacks. What we're missing is... speed. Ida? Todoroki asks, his head already turning to the tall boy in question. But Izuku shakes his head. No, I have to be the rider because I'm the shortest, which means that... I won't be on the ground to pivot Ida when it's needed. He's fast, but he's not quick. Most of Ida's prowess happens in a straight line. He hasn't quite figured out momentum and pinpoint turns yet. We can already move in a straight line thanks to your eyes, so we need someone who can snatch and whip us around corners. He hums to himself again before finding the perfect candidate. Tokiyami-kun, he calls out, waving his hand to get his fellow sentient quirk-haver's attention. Hey, do you want to team up? 
Tokihami makes his way over to them, eyes tracking the three of them standing there. His gaze lingers on the ten million points in Todoroki's hand for a long time. If they can keep the headband, it's an easy win, but it also makes them an immediate target. Tokiyami's smart. There's no way he's not thinking exactly that. Sure, he says, and Dark Shadow peeks over his shoulder. I would be honored to join you in this mad banquet of darkness. Izuku grins and holds out his gloved hand. Glad to have you. Hopefully you have some arm muscle, because I have to be the rider. I can manage. Tokiyami promises with a nod. Is there a plan? His eyes never stray from Izuku's face, which just makes Izuku beam as he pulls his three teammates aside and details out how they're going to win. They do win. Hitoshi still can't believe how easy it was, actually. Sure, Izuku had made it sound easy, but Izuku makes everything sound easy, and he's been like that since the day Hitoshi met him. Let's be heroes with these villainous quirks this, and it's just a two-kilometer run, and so you can do it that. Not to mention his analysis. I bet you could use your quirk through a phone, and... Do you think Ryota would be able to read your thoughts in my head if you brainwashed me first? It's scary, well and truly. But it's also beautiful. After determining that Tokiyami did not, in fact, have the arm strength to hold up Izuku, Todoroki and Otoshi were the cart, and Tokiyami was the horse. Izuku was a well-balanced and calm rider, directing them in advance so that their reactions timed well with what he wanted them to do. He was eerily calm the entire time. It's something that Otoshi has only seen on a select few occasions while Izuku was sparring with Aizawa-san. It's like he goes into a trance with his brain running a thousand kilometers per hour and his body is just reacting on instinct. They didn't have to steal any points. They didn't want to steal any points. There was no way any other group could catch up to them if even every other headband was held just by one other team. So they ran, and they dodged, and they won. The four of them stumble out of the stadium in a cluster, laughing together with the high of their ten million point win. They're all going to be opponents in the next round, of course, but for now they're victorious, and they're heading for lunch. Dark Shadow really likes you, Izuku, Todoroki says, watching as the quirk flits around from the safety of Tokiyami's side to inspect Izuku from every angle. Like recognizing like, Hitoshi offers with a tilt of his head. It's not technically true, of course, but neither Todoroki nor Tokiyami are in the know about the whole Amahaki situation, and Hitoshi isn't about to be the one spilling secrets. Oh, that would make sense. Todoroki's eyes turn considering, and Hitoshi watches the way his face twitches into a fraction of an expression. He's only been living with his Ashi-san for a little over a week, but the distance from his asshole of a father is already working wonders on Todoroki. It's easy to see now, in retrospect, where Todoroki had carried all of his stress, because it's just not there anymore. He's calm in a way he wasn't before, and he's quicker to smile and more prone to saying something in conversations. Endeavor had supposedly thrown a fit at the idea of Todoroki becoming a ward of UA, but according to Izuku, who would know, Nezu is scary as hell when he wants to be. Needless to say, eventually, Endeavor shut up, Todoroki went to that bastard's house with both Nezu and Hisashi-san present to pack his things, and then he moved in with Hisashi-san. Izuku giggles as Dark Shadow nudges his arm. I believe, Tokiyami says with all the air of a dying man from some era long past. The Dark Shadow is just enjoying a sunlight that he can actually bask in. That makes sense. Inasmuch as a quirk having sentience and preferences for things can make sense— Hitoshi's still trying to do the math in his head for that specific leap in evolution. Maybe he should ask Izuku about it sometime soon. I think Hitoshi's right, Izuku says, holding out his hand to Dark Shadow as they slot themselves into the lunch line. Dark Shadow tilts his head, studying Izuku's fingers before nudging against them. Slowly, Izuku pets down the length of Dark Shadow's head, scratching his fingers into the feather-like shadows toward the back. Dark Shadow is smart. I bet he knows we're the same. Something about the way Izuku says, we... There, it makes Hitoshi stiffen up. He doesn't think Izuku's talking about Amahaki, but what else could he mean? It's not like Izuku is a sentient quirk, which means he's talking about something else. Fuck. The villain deaths of the USJ. Hadn't one of them been in the downpour zone with Tokiyami? And Izuku. Izuku is in the ruined zone. Shit. Of course that's where Izuku's mind would go. Fuck that. Nah. Hitoshi says, slipping around Todoroki's side to drape himself over Izuku's back, both arms dangling from his shoulders, with his chin hooked over Izuku's head. I was just kidding. I think you're bright and warm, and Dark Shadow wants to spend some time in the sun. Toshi, Izuku grunts, spine bending under his weight, even though Itoshi is fully aware of how much Izuku can bench press. Heavy. I just had to carry your ass around the stadium for the last fifteen minutes, Hitoshi says as he wraps his arms around Izuku's chest. You have no right to complain about how heavy I may or may not be. Todoroki makes a sound that very well could be a laugh, but when Itoshi glances over at him, he looks like he just coughed. Hitoshi's eyes narrow, but he decides not to call him on it. 
By the time they get through the lunch line, the cafeteria is packed full, so they have to squeeze into a table with a good portion of the rest of their class. Izuku and Todoroki immediately get drawn into conversation with Yagirozu, Jiro, and Hagekure. Hitoshi has absolutely no intentions of talking to anyone, and it would have stayed that way had Kirishima not popped a tray down on the other side and immediately jostled him with his elbow. Congratulations! Kirishima grins, the sentiment echoed by Ashido and Saro on his other side. Maka goes there, too, but he just looks stormy and pissed off, so Hitoshi decides not to poke that bear. Probably stings Bakugo's pride to come in second place twice in a row, and Hitoshi really doesn't feel like getting a face full of explosives right now. Maybe later. They face off in the final event, but not while he still has lunch rushes, Oyakodon, to stuff into his face. He's starving, and he's not going to let his own smart mouth ruin his meal. Instead, he gives a brief smile to Kirishima. You too, and you guys were fucking monsters getting all those headbands. Shockingly, Bakugo had made his team give up chasing after Hitoshi's group fairly early on after Izuku had planned a combined attack between Tokiyami and Todoroki, which had been executed to perfection. Maybe it was fear, maybe it was self-preservation, maybe it was just smart strategy, but as soon as Bakugo's team swung away with their points still around Bakugo's neck, they never came back at them. They just went after the other groups instead. I still think it's crazy, Ashido says with her mouth half full of whatever vegetable monstrosity is on her tray. I mean... The fourth-place team to advance didn't even have any points. They just lasted the longest against us. Which is why it's bullshit we didn't win. Bakugo sees, and Hitoshi can practically see the smoke coming out of his mouth. We kicked everyone's ass. We fucking dominated. It's not our damn fault that ten million points was an impossible ceiling to hit. But that, of course, is the whole point. Hitoshi doesn't say it and doesn't want to, but the way society currently is, being at the top, being the best hero in the eyes of the public and the commission— comes with the weight and responsibilities as well as expectations that no one else can meet. All Might, terrible teacher that he is, holds up here a society on a pillar that's too tall to climb. And everyone thinks it's amazing and so cool or whatever the fuck, but it's toxic and backbreaking and it's not going to survive his inevitable retirement. Hitoshi is so fucking glad that he's going underground. If he had to deal with that billboard top 100 heroes bullshit, he'd go straight vigilante. Couldn't have done it without the perfect bait, Kirishima says with a laugh as he claps Hitoshi on the shoulder. Bakugo finds offense to that, of course, but Ashido and Saro join in on the laughter, and Hitoshi finds himself smiling despite the outbursts of the explosive blonde. The rest of lunch passes uneventfully, and soon enough they're being called back to the one egg waiting room, all eyes on the screen as they wait for the matchups for the third event to be displayed. Well, almost all eyes. Hitoshi had flopped down on one of the sofas as soon as he entered the room, and he'd only moved to let Izuku sit next to him, with his thigh as Hitoshi's new pillow. He's relaxed and a little sleepy after his lunch, and Izuku's fingers and his hair are not helping. He also really, really doesn't want to stare at a screen in nervous anticipation for the next however many minutes. It's up, Kaminari shouts. Oh, yikes. It was good knowing you, Shinso. Oh? Hitoshi opens his eyes and sits up just enough to see the screen, where the pairings are listed out in a bracket. He doesn't have to look long to see what Kaminari means. Hitoshi's in the first match, against Izuku. Damn, Hitoshi mutters, flopping back down. Izuku laughs softly, fingernails, scratching against his scalp in a way that sends shivers down Hitoshi's spine. You're the worst matchup for me, you know that? I can't even use my quirk against you. Izuku hums. You've beaten me in quirkless sparring before, though, multiple times. He looks down at Hitoshi, and his eyes are fond and full of a frankly insane amount of belief in Hitoshi's ability. I won't use my quirk against you, either. We'll just fight quirkless, and may the best fighter win. Hitoshi lifts his hand and pokes Izuku in the cheek, lightly at first and then forcefully enough to turn his head away. You're such a little shit. They both know that Hitoshi has never won a spar against Izuku without his capture weapon, and Hitoshi doesn't think today will be the first exception, but damned if he isn't going to try anyway. He does have the advantage of reach. With his quarterstaff, maybe he'll get lucky. There's a knock at the door before it opens, and Cementos leans his head into the room. Izuku and Shinso, come with me to your preparation rooms. Todoroki and Sero, Power Loto will be here in the next few minutes to take you to your rooms as well. With a heavy sigh, Hitoshi gets to his feet and drapes his arm over Izuku's shoulder once he joins him. They follow Cementos from the room and down a series of hallways. Izuku's dropped off first, and Hitoshi ruffles his hair before they part. There is no television in the room that Hitoshi's dropped off at, but there is a speaker near the door. He can hear Hisashi-san talking to the viewers, both in the stands and at home, about how the next event will go, but Hitoshi tunes it out. He knows how a sparring bracket works, and they've already been told that anything shy of seriously injuring a fellow student is allowed. When he's called to the stadium, Hitoshi pulls his quarterstaff out and slots it into its full-length version, spinning it around in his palm as he steps into the sunlight and the roar of the crowd. 
Izuka joins him a moment later from the other side of the arena, small, wide, and bright on his face. I'm going to kick your ass, Izuku laughs, and Itoshi knows that's the last time he's going to hear Izuku speak before the fight is over. Kayama-san cracks her whip, and Hitoshi dives forward first. Without his capture weapon, he's forced to get in close, and he'd rather do it on his terms rather than Izuku's. He swings his quarterstaff at Izuku's legs, hoping to sweep him off balance in his opening move, but Izuku flips backwards out of the way and then dashes forward as Hitoshi scrambles to cover his openings. They trade blows over and over, Izuku getting a few lucky punches and kicks into Hitoshi's stomach and thighs, and Hitoshi managing to get Izuku down on one knee for a solid half-second before Izuku is surging back up. Hitoshi feels nearly feral the longer they fight, but it's fun. He's always loved sparring with Izuku, loved the way that they balance each other out to the point that gaining the upper hand often comes down to nothing but stamina and luck. Unfortunately, Izuku has always been a stamina monster. With a well-timed shove against Hitoshi's chest, Izuku hooks the heel of his foot around Hitoshi's ankle and sends him crashing onto his back. Izuku follows him down, pinning his hands above his head and using his weight to keep Hitoshi's thighs on the floor. Shinso, can you move? Kayama-san calls from the edge of the sparring circle. Hitoshi huffs and rolls his eyes as he fights to get his breath back. No. Kayama-san raises her whip. Shinso is pinned. Aizawa wins the round. Izuku's off of him immediately, dragging him up by the grip of his wrists and hand nodded into the front of Hitoshi's gym shirt. You okay? Izuku asks, just as breathless as Hitoshi is. With a nod, Hitoshi leans against Izuku and lets himself be pulled from the stadium. Fuck, that was rough. He holds a hand over his ribs and winces. Bakugo's right, you know. You do hit like a train. Izuku laughs, high and breathy, as he all but drags Satoshi back to the waiting room for water and then up into the designated 1A section of the stands. Several people congratulate Izuku on the win and give Hitoshi sympathetic looks, but Hitoshi doesn't care. His loss isn't exactly a surprise, and honestly, he's kind of glad. He went through the whole sports festival and didn't use his quirk even once, which means there's absolutely no risk of people finding out how to circumvent it. So he settles into his seat next to Izuku, and mostly tunes out their classmates, far more interested in the rest of the fights about to play out before him. Izuku doesn't want to fight Todoroki. He's not sure why. Maybe it's because he knows Todoroki's quirk inside and out. It's probably not that, actually, since he has nearly the same knowledge about all of his classmates' as quirks. Or maybe it's because Todoroki's been so happy in the last week, and Izuku doesn't want to do something that might break that happiness. But no, it's probably not that either. Todoroki already said that he doesn't have anything left to prove, that he can fight how he wants, that he isn't here to shove a glacier into Endeavor's face like the world's biggest middle finger. In fact, Izuku's pretty sure it has nothing to do with Todoroki at all. You ready, Izuku? Todoroki asks, glancing sideways briefly at Ate Kayama before his gaze moves back to Izuku. You don't look so great. Yeah, that makes a strange amount of sense. Izuku doesn't feel so great. I'm fine, he says, but his fingers tremble as he slips his right glove off and tucks it into his pocket. Hopefully it doesn't fall out during the fight. Amahaki's power surges up his spine along his arms and trickles like cold water down his ribs. Izuku breathes into it, letting himself adjust to the spread of strength and power and the promise of as much destruction as he wants. Just a little, Izuku thinks, eyes sweeping the arena, the stands, the cutout windows of the announcer's box. We know how to beat him without hurting him. A rush of images and concepts and half-formed emotions race through Izuku's mind, formulating acquiescence, agreement, excitement. Amahaki is ready for the fight, maybe too ready, but Izuku doesn't want his stint in the sports festival to end here, and he can't beat Todoroki without his power. Not now that Todoroki isn't afraid of his fire anymore. Ante Kayama's whip snaps, and Izuku hears the first shot of ice before he sees it. He flicks his fingers, casually, sending a black hole out to break the formation. More ice, another black hole. Neither of them have even moved yet. Ranged attacks, such a fallback for them, that there doesn't seem to be a point in taking even a single step. Is this going to be a stamina contest? Izuku wonders out loud as he drops a black hole near Todoroki's right side to stop the ice attack before it starts. No, probably not. What they're racing against isn't the end of their stamina, but the onset of hypothermia. Izuku's going to get frostbite long before Todoroki does, as long as Todoroki uses his fire. Fine, then. Todoroki-kun. He calls as he takes a step forward. He can feel the give of the ground beneath his foot, a spider web of cracks racing through the cement. Black smoke rises up along the edges of his vision, and Izuku swears he sees a clawed hand reaching over his shoulder, fingers too long to be human. Across the arena, Todoroki's fire flares to life. Izuku smiles, and it's small, but warm. I'm really proud of you for using your fire, but I think we both know you'd win if this drags out, so I'm not going to let it. 
He thinks it's kind of ironic, actually, that he is the one who's always preaching to his friends that they can't rely on their quirks so much, that they have to learn how to navigate a battlefield under the assumption that they may have to drag themselves out of a fight with their quirk erased or overused, and yet he doesn't have to worry about that. Here, where Zuko could be putting on a show where he has every reason to downplay the amount of strength, violence, and power twisting along his bones and crackling under his skin, he is instead going to win with nothing but the gifts of a god forced upon him. Izuka drops a black hole in between them. To disrupt the attack, he knows Todoroki's going to throw at him, and then he sets down a line of them behind Todoroki. His friend tries to throw up walls of ice to stop his slow drag backward out of the arena, but he can't form ice where vapor has been cleared away. In the end, Izuka wins after having taken just that one step. But as soon as Auntie Kayama calls Izuka's wind, he yanks his glove back on, jogs over to Todoroki, eyeing him with apprehension. Um, sorry? Why are you sorry? Todoroki asked, tilting his head sideways like a confused cat. You beat me. You knew how to beat me. It was your win. He doesn't even look a little mad. Besides, didn't I already say that I have nothing to prove today? Izuka laughs like it's punched out of him, relief flooding his veins. You're right. You're so right. Grinning ear to ear, Izuka grabs Todoroki by the wrist and leads him out of the stadium. Shota twists around in the front seat of Izashi's car, and a rare smile pulls at his mouth at the sight of the three boys passed out in the back. Izuka's in the middle, a tiny pillar of support, sitting up straight despite his head lolling to the side. Shinzo's on Izuka's left, probably intentionally, and he slouched down and curled up into Izuka's side, head on his shoulder, and both hands clutching Izuka's arm. And Todoroki's on the other side, slumped against Izuka's shoulder, with the top of his head barely brushing against Izuka's ear. Around Izuka's neck rests a gold medal, gleaming in the sunlight filtering through the windows. "'Take a picture!' Izashi whispers, glee lining every inch of his tone. Digging his phone out of his pocket, Shota's careful to check and make sure the shutter sound is actually off before rotating the phone and taking a picture. And then another, and another. He's a proud parent, and he's not going to deny that to himself. Sure, fine, maybe the only kid of his in the backseat is Izuku, but... Shota trained Shinso, and Shota's best friend is now Todoroki's legal guardian. He's proud, and the boys worked hard, and they're arguably adorable. I'll send them to you, Shota promises as he turns back around and clicks back into his seatbelt. They all worked hard today, Izashi says, and it's not hard to recognize his own feelings of pride and happiness and a smile and words and the way he keeps glancing through his rearview mirror into the back seat. Shota hums in agreement. The sports festival, especially for first years, accomplishes a multitude of tasks every year that varies according to the denomination of the persons involved. To viewers, it's entertainment that's worth the price of admission. Citizens get to see kids with powerful and fairly well-mastered quirks competing against each other in a fun and relatively safe environment. For pro heroes, it allows them to get a good look at the next generation before they're influenced by internships or work studies and before they've cemented themselves into a hero track. It's an opportunity to spot a star pupil or a diamond in the rough, and they can offer to teach them the ropes. For teachers at UA, it's a great chance to look for areas of improvement and pick out students who may have had bad habits they need to break. But it's also an easy way to award kids for the amount of effort that they put into learning and mastering their quirks. For the students, it's a chance to prove themselves. Shinso had done a great job at managing each of the tasks in accordance to how he wants to be a hero. As an underground hero, it's good to be independent, but it's also good to know when you need assistance to get the job done. Depending too much on his own quirk could have gotten Shinso into a lot of trouble in the first and second events. Instead, he pushed himself to do it quirkless, to keep pace with the Zuku through obstacle course, and then to team up with the Zuku in the team event. And in the third event, neither of them had used their quirks, and they proved to everyone watching that they're strong even without that tool available to them. And because he never used his quirk, he didn't give away any of his activation requirements, which had been the biggest hang-up on going into the sports festival in the first place. Todoroki made it known exactly what kind of hero he's looking to be, someone who doesn't rely on others, but who is willing to work with them, even outside of a leadership position, and his quirk is flashy, but his personality isn't and any pro hero worth their salt will be able to see his promise as a twilight underground or a rescue hero. He did the opposite of Shinso and relied on his quirk for the entire festival. His ice had gotten him through the entirety of the obstacle course. He used both his ice and fire to maintain distance between his team and the others during the cavalry battle, and he used his quirk to gain one win and one loss in the solos, and the whole thing was a big middle finger to Endeavor. It was great to watch. Izuku, on the other hand, threw everyone for a loop, during the obstacle course, he had used his quirk once, and that was it, despite the fact that he could have used it to force every other competitor to stay behind him, or to propel himself over the chasm. He ran on his own, crossed the finish line of his own merit, in a comfortable pacing. 
With a cavalry battle, Izuku used his brain, and only his brain. Obviously. Two of his teammates were for sentimental reasons. Once his boyfriend and the other is his brother, but Shota's at least fairly sure that Izuku would have ditched them if they didn't work well together. But they were a perfect team, and all they needed was to fill a niche that Tokiyami had fit into perfectly. And Izuku didn't use his quirk, but it was obvious even from the announcer's booth that that team was fully led and instructed by Izuku's strategies. And in the solo rounds, Izuku had dominated. His fight against Shinso had gone as Shota expected. Shinso likes to be ranged and has gotten very comfortable with the capture weapon, so his defeat was inevitable when faced with Izuku's stamina. In the fight against Todoroki, though, Shota saw something. Saw some switch inside of Izuku flip and click into place. Instead of looking for a fight, Izuku was looking for a takedown. The same thing happened against Ida in the next round. All Izuku had to do was wait for Ida to charge him, then sidestep and use his quirk to let gravity and momentum pull Ida out of the arena. Shota thinks that the final round against Bakugo would have lasted longer if Bakugo hadn't shouted across the arena something about Izuku not holding anything back. The moment that Namuri had cracked her whip, Izuku's hand was already out, and Bakugo was thrown from the arena in the span of a breath. The fight had lasted less than a second, but Bakugo hadn't seemed angry about the loss. Unfortunately, below all the pride that Shota feels for his son and his son's friends, there's a little tremor of fear. Because Izuku doesn't have a quirk, and that's the strongest that Shota's ever seen Amahaki act outside of fully possessing Izuku. And maybe it was the trick of the light. Or perhaps it was Shota's own apprehensions making him see things, but he swears. There were times when a shadowy form loomed over Izuku's body, claws extended in black blood dripping visible only between one blink and the next. But that's not something that Shota has to figure out right now. His only job at the moment is getting all three boys safely to his apartment, feeding them, and making sure they sleep at a reasonable time. Izashi, bless him, is here to help him with that as well. When they reach the apartment and the car shuts off, Izuku stirs awake in the back seat. Shota turns around to watch him, partially confused that this is a pattern for his number one problem child, but mostly he just expects it to happen now. There are a lot of noises and disturbances that Izuku can sleep through. The commotion of the cats, the general noise of the street if the windows are open, the television no matter the volume, but there are two things that wake him up no matter what. The call of his name, and the transition of a vehicle from running to turned off. Home? Izuku asks, scrubbing his face as he blinks with squinted eyes at the car around him and the scene through the windows. Yeah, we're home, Shota confirms, watching him closely for a moment before getting out of the car. He's mid-stretch, when the back door opens and Shinso stumbles out, Izuku's hand firmly pushing at his back to make him move. On the other side, Todoroki looks not awake, but at least more steady. Izuku follows Shinso out of the car with alert eyes, head swiveling around before he smiles at Todoroki across the top of the car, which he's barely tall enough to do so. Shinso immediately turns around and drapes himself all over Izuku's back, making Izuku burst into a fit of giggles. Hitoshi, he whines, tipping his head to the side in a way that keeps him from getting a face full of purple hair. Can't you walk on your own? Shinso grunts and shakes his head, tightening his arms around Izuku's shoulders as if to prove his point. With a sigh and an exasperated look towards Shota, Izuku crouches down and bodily lifts Shinso onto his back with his hands secured under Shinso's thighs. You're teaching him bad habits, Shota says, though he pushes the car door closed as soon as Izuku steps away from it. Izuku's responding smile is bright and warm. Yeah, but I can handle it, so it's okay. Hitoshi mumbles something into Izuku's shoulder that's too low for Shota to hear, but it makes Izuku laugh, so whatever it is, it's fine. Sighing quietly and rolling his eyes, Shota turns around and leads the way up the stairs and into the apartment. Leo and Coco make their presences known with loud screams, one like a chain smoker and the other like a squeaky toy, and Shota gently nudges them out of the way so everyone else can stumble inside. It's not lost on Shota that, since bringing Izuku into his life, his apartment has become the official hosting location for both his friends and Izuku's. Prior to Izuku, all hangouts were at at Hizashi's apartment, or sometimes Namuri's, but she's into weird shit and Shota still to this day would rather not step into her living space. But habits were formed when Izuku was younger, when it was more comfortable for him to meet new people in a space that he could call his own, and that had a lockable room he could retreat to if he got overwhelmed. And now this is just how the world runs. Shota is a terrible host, though, so it's a good thing that everyone who steps through the door is family and knows better than to ask for things that they can get themselves. All three of you go shower, Shota says, hurting the boys down the hall once their shoes are off. Todoroki keeps a little goat bag here with clothes in it, for instances just like this, and Shinso has been keeping clothes in one of Izuku's wardrobe drawers for over a year now. Dinner will be ready by the time you're done. Use the opportunity to wake up a little bit, because you're not going back to sleep until a normally acceptable bedtime. Shinso groans dramatically, and Todoroki sympathetically passes back while Izuku drags them both down the hall by their wrists. 
When they're out of sight, Shota retreats to the kitchen and turns his attention to Izashi. I know we're about to celebrate what they did today, but serious talk for a second. He says as he starts to take food out of the refrigerator. Izashi hums and settles in beside him at the counter. All right, I can push my giddiness down for a minute. What's up? How is Todoroki settling in with you? He's doing good at school and seems to be responding better with his peers, but I'm curious. At that, Hisashi beams. The listener's doing great, honestly. He's calling me Hisashi at home now, which I think is big for him. He's always so formal, you know? Hell, Hisashi continues. You might even let me call him by his given name soon. I'm not going to push him, though. The boys still call him Todoroki, so until he gives me the green light, I'll keep things as they are. Shota tables that thought for later. Good. I know he has a check-in with Nezu and Kiyumi-san next week, but... I wanted to touch base with you first, just to get to your side of it. He's better than he was, at the very least. Oh, yeah. Hisashi agrees as they start preparing dinner, Katsudan, together. He's come out of his shell a lot, even just in a week. It's actually kind of sad in a way, you know? He sighs and looks up at the ceiling for a moment. I mean, it's not like I'm doing anything special. We don't have big heart-to-hearts or anything. I literally just exist as an adult around him and ask about his day and help him when he needs it. But he's thriving under that. I really consider what I'm doing as the bare minimum. Shota knows exactly what Hisashi means. Izuku was the same way when he first arrived. Acting like Shota's mere presence was something amazing. You're being a parent, Zashi. The kids never had that before, or at least, not in a long time. Hisashi gives a small smile and returns to work. Yeah, I know. That's what I mean. I hate seeing kids like that. Where they're so used to violence and absence that being in the room with an authority figure that isn't out to get them is suddenly the most revolutionary experience in the world. Breaks my damn heart. Shota bumps his shoulder into his ashes, holding the pressure for a moment before retreating. You're doing well, though. He trusts you, and if he's calling you by your given name already, he likes you. I know, his ashi laughs. Thank God for Izuku, though. I think I would have been out of my death on dealing with some of Todoroki's trauma if I hadn't helped Izuku through his own. And between you and me, Todoroki's a walk in the park, comparatively. Now, that doesn't surprise Shota at all. Todoroki had an abusive home and a lot of parental trauma, but Izuku had almost a decade of experimentation and pain. They're both broken boys, and they're both mending, but some wounds are easier to deal with than others. Speaking of Izuku and trauma, Shota says voice still low and serious even as he gets the pork cooking and turns around to keep his eyes out for eavesdroppers. Oh no, Izashi murmurs. What happened? Shota shakes his head once and folds his arms across his chest. I'm not sure. Something about the way that he fought in the solo event didn't sit right with me. He seems fine now, but there were moments when I saw it, Zashi. I swear to you, I saw Mahaki, and that scares the shit out of me. He glares at the table in front of him, five chairs now a permanent fixture around its circumference. I don't know if that thing is gaining power or if Izuku is getting more comfortable using it, but the amount of destruction he can cause with just one glove off. Izashi sets a hand on Shota's shoulder and squeezes. Talk to him about it. I'll be there with you if you want. Yeah. A conversation really is the next logical step. They haven't had much of a chance to really talk about Amahaki since school year started, and it seems like little ages ago, even though it's only been, what, three weeks? Fuck. You should be there. You trained him with it just as much as I did, and I want your input even if he doesn't, which we both know he will. The bathroom door opens and Shinzo walks out and disappears into Izuka's room. A few seconds later, Izuka steps out of his room, catches sight of Shota, waves, and then disappears into the bathroom. You don't have to worry about that now, though. Izashi says with another squeeze to show to shoulder. They've got the next two days off, and then the weekend. We can sit down some time then and figure out what's going on. Shota nods once, a little tense, and tries to make his shoulders relax. He's worried, but not overly so. He can put aside his concerns for now at the very least, and let Izuku Shinso and Todoroki all sit in their accomplishments for tonight. They did really well, and they deserve to celebrate and relax at least for one night. Before Shinso has to... Go home tomorrow, and Shota and Hisashi have to help run security at the second year's sports festival tomorrow. Tonight isn't a night for heavy conversations about ancient gods. Tonight they can all just be family. And Shota sends up a quiet thanks to whatever deities might be listening, that they get to have this well-deserved moment of rest and happiness after all the bullshit that they've gone through lately. All right, listeners, this concludes chapter 34 of Swallow the Stars. I love that the author just concised the sports festival into a single chapter. That makes me happy. I like fix where they're drawn out too, so don't get me wrong, but sometimes it is nice for it just to be one chapter over and done. Let me know your all's thoughts and reactions, and as always, thank you so much for listening.